fair to say that the study of the Viking Age and the Viking Age in general have typically suffered from something of a masculinity problem. There's not time here to unpick the problems associated with the terminology of Viking Age in reference to this period of Scandinavian history and the history of where Scandinavians were at this time, but for now we can acknowledge that the terminology generally brings with it strong associations with raiding, something which feeds into, this percep into the perception of this time as overtly masculine and militaristic. Um, so scholarship on the Viking Age has worked first of all to civilise this stereotype of the barbaric Vikings by drawing attention to trading rather than raiding activity in order to present them as civilised and peaceful people. And then with the development of gender studies, um, Viking Age women have been brought into focus too. This has helped to dilute the masculinity fixation that this period has suffered from, but there are still problems. Last year, for example, a study was published on the skeletal material from grave BG, BJ581 at the Swedish trading site of Birka, indicating female sex in a grave that had traditionally been considered male because it contained warrior equipment and was in the military garrison aspect of the island of Birka. This caused huge media ripples. People were so excited we'd found a female <coughs> warrior, but people were also very upset. They were upset by the idea that a Viking warrior could be female. They were upset that this played into stereotypes about Valkyries and Amazons and shield maidens, and they questioned the integrity of the osteological study itself. However, people rarely pause to consider that biological sex is not indicative of gender, or that our own construction of a gender binary might not be applicable to the Viking Age. The furore was largely centered around speculation and horror about a woman intruding in a masculine space, and this reaction is a good example of how attitudes about Viking Age raiding and military activity are heavily fixated on the perception of this field as entirely masculine. We should bear this in mind, um, the relationship between masculinity and raiding, when we approach the issue of loot from the Viking raids on the British Isles. The raids on the British Isles are typically what we see as the genesis of the Viking Age itself. Um, much of the material that was acquired during raids um, and tribute that was extracted during raids takes the form of coins and various types of metalwork. And to a large extent, this was melted down and reused as other objects. Um, but we still see a significant amount of insular metalwork surviving. Um, when scraps of insular metalwork like this, either from secular or religious settings, are preserved intact, they are often adapted as items of jewellery, um, brooches and pendants, for example. The nature of this insular metalwork, um, the way in which it is when adapted as jewellery, appears to indicate a raiding background rather than the peaceful movement of these objects, because we especially see hack marks, evidence of damage. These items are very fragmentary in the way in which they're displayed as jewellery. Now, the fate of this material is incredibly gendered in its reception. In Norway, 80% of insular material, that is, material from Britain and Ireland, has been found in female burials, and loot especially so. When we look at examinations and ideas about the reasons for the Viking raids in the first place, this gendered pattern seems to expand. In 2008, James Barrett argued that at least in the early Viking Age, the purpose of raiding was for men, who were at a surplus within the population, to acquire money and loot to use as a bride price in order to secure themselves a wife back home. If we accept loot as a form of bride price, then, we establish raiding within the masculine context overshadowing the Viking Age as a whole, and we can imagine that loot converted into jewellery as a politicised form of female adornment was representative of a woman's husband's exploits as a Viking raider. Barrett's explanation of how insular material arrived in the hands of women is well supported by the evidence and makes sense. It creates a neat narrative into which the female ownership of virtually all insular or looted material can be slotted quite easily. However, it is something that I've questioned previously on the basis of the fact that it should not be accepted as the only route by which loot passed into female hands. My first dissections of this blanket interpretation of the relationship between raiding and the loot itself approached the idea of trade as an alternative means of moving loot. Following Charlotte Blintheim and Judith Yesh, who have mentioned the idea of a second-hand trade in insular metalwork generally within Scandinavia, I've argued on the basis of evidence from the trading site of Kalpang in Norway that raiders could and did stop at trading sites on their journeys home from the British Isles and sold off the loot that they'd gathered in order to cash it in for objects that they wanted or needed. 
This, in turn, placed the loot in the hands not of the people who had raided it in the first place, but with craftspeople at trade centres who could then sell it on to interested parties, themselves unconnected with the actual raid. The images here display the partially melted contents of a crucible, attesting to the active reuse of metals. Coins are clearly visible within it. Um, and also a gilt copper alloy mount um, of Iber Hiberno-Scottish or Northumbrian origin. This was either part of a horse harness or was a strap for a reliquary in a monastery. Um, but in its surviving shape, it's broken and displays evidence of adaptation. It appears that a pin terminal was added on the back of the object, um, so an iron pin was added so that it could be worn as a brooch. But in the context in which this is found, it was in a mercantile setting, it was in the workshop layers of the excavation, not in a burial. So it was either a pin that had been worn and lost, or had been resold to a craftsperson for further recycling. Like much of the insular material that we find across Norway and Scandinavia, this is fragmentary. Um, we're, we're looking at insular material at a disconnect from the narrative of raiding here, and suggesting that not all female-owned loot was an active reflection of the activities of raiding, but instead carried different meanings. The situating of this object in a clearly mercantile context distances it from raiding, in that it appears that it was trade activity rather than raiding activity that placed the subject in the hands of a woman. As such, it was perhaps not her husband's war trophy, but something with an entirely different meaning. Now, previously, this is where I'd left a consideration of alternative routes for the movement and ownership of Viking loot. It seemed sufficient to make the suggestion that loot could be traded as well as raided, serving as a reminder that the people who raided were often the same people who acted as merchants when the circumstances called for it. This alone moved us out of the heteronormative narrative of husband goes raiding, brings home gifts for wife. However, particularly in light of the recent publication of the Melhus reliquary from a burial in central Norway, it is possible to look at other forms of female usage of insular objects and to broaden the examination of these objects in a way which can offer a queer reading. In addition to placing the movement of loot in Scandinavia outside of the heteronormative bride price narrative, we can queer the symbolism and impact of the loot once owned by women. The Melhus reliquary is one of many grave goods found in a burial mound in central Norway, as I said. It has recently been subject to research by Einahin Peterson and Griffin Murray, who have discussed the shrine in detail and made suggestions about its usage in Viking Age Norway. And it's from their 2018 article that I've taken details on the shrine itself and the finds context. The Melhus farm is the site of six barrows, and so is in a prominent area in the landscape as far as burial displays are concerned. Based on the dating of weapons and brooches in the grave, an early Viking Age date is offered indicating that the Melhus Reliquary would have arrived in the area at a very early stage in the context of Viking raids and interactions with the British Isles. The object itself is wooden with copper alloy mounts and is one of 12 insular house-shaped shrines which are known to have survived in more or less complete form. We know of two others from Norway. Um, on the basis of the artistic styles, we think the object was probably made in the 7th or the 8th century. Um, and it had straps, you can see, a mount at one side. It had leather straps for carrying um, in its original context. In an ecclesiastical setting, this was probably for the movement of saintly relics, um, but it could also have been used as a container for the Eucharist. <clears throat> now, the burial in question is a double burial of a man and a woman, but it's generally being considered that the reliquary itself belonged to the woman interred in the mound. <coughs> Previous suggestions as to the function of the reliquary in a Norse context, where this reliquary has even been considered at all, have posited the idea that the box was used as something like a trinket box for the woman, for holding her jewellery, and so on. The most recent analysis of the reliquary, however, does suggest otherwise, not least because when the shrine was deposited in the grave, it was stored within a wooden box. It appears that the reliquary itself was not used as a storage container, but was instead important enough to require its own storage. First, there's the issue that this shrine, unlike the vast majority of metalwork from ecclesiastical settings which has ended up in Scandinavia, was preserved intact. Although it's small enough that it could have been easily carried off intact, it's 83 millimetres by 118 by 47 millimetres, so it's quite a portable object, there's perhaps something to be said though for the fact that this object was preserved intact. It's possible that it was intentionally brought back to Norway in such a way that it could be reused and reappropriated. A second issue is religious and ritual usage. In the past, it has sometimes been used as evidence for early Christian missionary activity in Norway. 
but it's of too early a date and certainly it was buried too early for this to really hold out. And the circumstances of the burial, this is a double burial of a man and a woman. This can't have been Christian missionaries. It's very difficult to say that these people could have been early converts to Christianity. A ritual context, however, has been suggested in the sense of pre-Christian religious activity. The preservation of the leather strap attached to the mount on the reliquary has been used as evidence that the reliquary could have been carried and worn on special occasions. And the woman in this burial also possessed a very large button-on bow brooch, the largest type that actually survives today. And certainly this brooch was too large for everyday wear. So it's been suggested that perhaps she wore this brooch on special occasions and used the reliquary at the same time. The burial also contained a whalebone plaque and an iron rod. And these objects are frequently associated with ritual activity during the Viking Age. Certainly, the reliquary would have served as a powerful visualiser and mnemonic prompt for voyages abroad and for mythology and beliefs connected to this. If we think about ideas related to object biography, the basic narrative of this object's transfer from the British Isles to Norway is important to the object's future use, but the reliquary was also possibly more broadly symbolic too. <coughs> Having established the possibility then that this burial was that of a woman involved in some sort of cult activity, we can then look at this through a queer lens. Cultic and ritual activities and roles in old Nordic religion and belief are often viewed as areas of society which transgress gender boundaries as we view them today, and a sense of otherness is frequently assigned to burials which are considered to be connected to cult activity. We see this sense of transgression and queerness in other burials from Viking Age Scandinavia which have been assaulted with cult behaviour. There are, for example, two women, one buried at Kalpang in Norway and the other at Firkat, um, oops, um, Firkat in Denmark, um, which is a ring fortress. Um, these two women were wearing some form of leather costume when buried, which is incredibly unusual in the archaeological context and has led to suggestions for these two women of a cultic role outside of normal social boundaries. And these two burials are part of a wider pattern in which we see female burials with objects which don't fit our idea of conventional femininity and societal roles. The Melhus burial doesn't transgress gender to this degree, in that the woman was buried with a man, and with oval brooches emblematic of women across the Viking diaspora, there are the oval brooches as jewellery are seen as something of an ethnic and gender signifier for Viking Age women. But even the act of being a ritual leader queers her identity in our eyes. We see her as different and other in comparison to our general perceptions of women in Viking Age Norway. I'm using the idea of queering here primarily in terms less of a dissection of this woman's gender and sexuality, but more broadly in line with Chelsea Blackmore's thinking that queering should challenge and deconstruct narratives which put forward the norm. As established, the narratives associated with raiding and the giving of loot as gifts for brides and wives is inherently heteronormative, so the Melhus reliquary in its owner offer up the opportunity for a queer narrative purely on the basis of a departure from this traditional norm. This approach focuses on the micro rather than on a broader narrative. It's almost a micro-historical take, because by honing in on one specific object and its owner, we can unpick it in a way that is perhaps more valuable at this stage for queer theoretical analyses than a sweeping assessment of general trends, whereas the heteronormative narratives challenged by queer theory have by nature been able to be very generalised because they're the accepted norm, this approach needs to take on individual cases in order to offer up alternative readings and situations. The woman who owned the Melhus reliquary was clearly a very powerful woman. The prestige of the other objects she owned and the circumstances of her burial mound attest to this. This, combined with the possible use of her reliquary in a Norse religious context, move her outside of the heteronormative narrative in which men brought loot home from Viking raids and gave it to their wives, who would wear it as a means of displaying the spoils of war procured by their men. This traditional narrative looks at how women are as symbolic of their men. So we see elsewhere in the Viking world, the Arab diplomat Ibn Fadlan talks about the Vikings in Russia and says that Viking women wore a neck ring to represent every 10,000 dirhams, that's coins, that their husband possessed. And we can almost argue that in a similar way here, that women in Norway were wearing loot based on the fact that their husband had been on a Viking raid and it was representative of that. By looking at this, outside of this narrative though, the Melhus woman, her, unless her husband had gone raiding with the specific intent of procuring her a prop for her ritual activity, we can imagine a different route for the procurement of this material um, and thus different connotations once in use in Norway. Besides, this wasn't an item to be worn um, 
She kept it in a box and presumably only removed it on special occasions. This wasn't like the jewellery, which was a very clear and permanent symboliser of a husband's writing. Um, so as the burial doesn't easily fit the accepted heteronormative narrative of man raids, gives wife gifts, it's a good starting point from which to queer the way in which we look at loot more generally. Considering the meanings and usage purposes for the women who owned it, and it must be remembered in this context that it's largely female graves in which we find this material, it's a useful exercise in reconsidering our approach to gender and societal norms in the Viking Age. We do need to be wary of ascribing a cultic purpose to the Melhus reliquary and just leaving it at that and saying that that's queered the object, queered the owner. Um, it's been pointed out that gender analyses of the Viking Age typically place women in one of two boxes. There's the normative, traditionally expected housewife and lady of the farm. And then there's the boundary breaking cult specialist who essentially serves as shorthand for anything which is non-normative or queer. This is emblematic of an issue with the use of queer theory in this field. It's too easy, especially where pre-Christian religion is concerned, to overemphasize the queerness and transgressiveness of ritual activity when we operate within a binary of female behavior as normative or non-normative. There's no room to straddle the boundaries between the two. Certainly, it's far too simplistic to suggest that the woman who owned the Melhus reliquary was a cult leader and simply because of this, having put her in her neat little non-normative box, claim that this is the extent to which her experience and that of her Viking loot can be queered. It is, however, a good starting point from which we can begin to explore Viking loot in an obviously non-traditional perspective, or at least a non-traditional perspective by our own contemporary standards. Applying a heteronormative reading to the spoils of war carries the danger of dismissing the use and value of these objects once in Norway. As raiding trophies presented to a wife, they're foreign trinkets for female wear, symbolic of male victory and success. As jewellery, they're easily tri trivialised within the archaeological material, even if we argue for their political imagery and representation. If we disconnect them from this narrative, though, and see them as personal possessions, we can remove objects such as the Melhus reliquary um, from this hypermasculinized heteronormative raiding narrative, for example, by accruing some sense of cultic significance, or at the very least, a subversion of the original meaning. Queer theory has already taken a number of exciting strides within the field that generally fits under the umbrella of Viking and medieval Scandinavian studies. There is, however, a lot more to be done. This year um, has seen the founding of the Norse Queer and Gender Studies Student Network, which is based on Facebook, and this functions as a really important resource for students to access information, reading lists, relevant opportunities such as call for papers, and it's created a really useful community of students who've already helped to unite this area um, in a way that's often quite difficult to do for students who are at an early stage and are less likely to get out and network so easily. A journal is also launch launched in the same field. King Gerby, so named after the Icelandic word for gender, is a peer-reviewed student journal with a focus on gender, queer theory, and the other in Viking and medieval Scandinavian studies. We've currently got our call for papers live, and we're looking for articles and book reviews by students um, before the end of January. So if you're a student working in the field, if you know students working in the field, please pass it on. The reception of the journal is exactly has demonstrated exactly why it's necessary. Um, We've been flawed by the positive responses we've received, but we've also come across people who don't understand the necessity of something that doesn't relate to their own personal experience. We had one fellow student, for example, a straight man who has come into contact with some queer and gender theory, who couldn't understand the demand for it and thought that um, we were being a little bit ridiculous and that this journal was not going to be a success. To quote him directly to round off, I just wasn't sure if there was a market for it to be successful. If there was an academic journal dedicated to tattoos in ancient Greece and Rome, I would have an identical reaction. And this is a straight man responding to what he feels is the significance of queer and gender studies as a field. It's a thriving field, but we need to move it away from the fringes so that we're developing a future in which at a postgraduate level, there is a basic grounding in gender and queer theory as standard across the board so that people value the importance and the significance and the depth of this field. Thank you very much for listening.